Before we pray together, one or two of you may have noticed that today is a very important anniversary in the uh, years of the Christian churches down the centuries. It's a birthday today of that man there. John Calvin was born 500 years ago today. Whether you're a Calvinist or not, I thought, well, 500 years today, we ought to say something about it here at our Bible convention. Uh, he made tremendous theological contribution to the Christian church. Uh, but above all, what he stood for was consecutive Bible exposition. In his great ministry in Geneva, in the middle of the 16th century, he preached through books of the Bible, rather in the way that we've been having here this week, both morning and evening. In fact, he was so determined to do that, that um, um, when he came back, he, he had two uh, times in Geneva with a three-year gap in between, and when he came back after his enforced absence, uh, he started to preach again exactly the section of the page of the Bible he left off when he was thrown out of the city three years early. And uh, I thought it would be good um, to remember this because it's very much our aim as a convention uh, to seek to promote the cause of expository Bible preaching uh, in our churches up and down this area and we pray further afield as well. So let's pray together. Lord God, on this particular anniversary, we thank you for the recovery of the Bible at the Reformation and for the men that God raised up for this task. We pray for the spread of this kind of preaching in our area, that week by week, God's people would be fed from God's Word. We make it our prayer this evening that in every district in our area, there would be a church where the Scriptures are opened up, where people who are not yet yours can go and hear the glorious news of the Lord Jesus Christ, clearly and faithfully explained. We know that in our land there is a famine of the Word of God. We pray therefore for theological colleges training people to go out and be ministers of the Gospel. We pray for pastors and Christian leaders to stick faithfully to the task that they were ordained to do, the prayer and ministry of the Word. And we pray this summer for the many camps, young people's ventures, conventions scattered all around this country with thankfulness where the Bible is to be opened. And we ask that you bless each of these ventures and occasions with faithfulness to uh, your Word. And we pray that the eyes of many would be opened. We pray that hearts will be set on fire and wills and minds changed for you as your word takes root. And this evening as we come to the last part of the book of Habakkuk, how we thank you for your servant Habakkuk. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit you inspired him to write these words, not only for your people then, but through, through him for us today. We pray that your servant would explain these words clearly. We thank you for the gifts that you've given him in this regard. And we pray that you'll help each one of us to listen carefully and to take heed and for our lives to go on being changed by you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just say my thanks to you from Barbara and myself for the gracious and kind reception we've had. Um, some of our people, if they were here and experienced what we've experienced, would say, y'all are just great, <laughs> and we thank you for it. Now tonight we're looking at Habakkuk, <clears throat> you know the standard joke, it's Habakkuk with you and Habakkuk with me, but it's okay. Uh, it's too late to teach old dogs new tricks. Um, so. Uh, Habakkuk 3, verses 16 to 19 tonight. And uh, it's still a part of Habakkuk's prayer. All of chapter 3 hangs together as one piece. But toward the end of that prayer, he goes into a kind of confession of faith. And so we're looking at the last part of his prayer tonight uh, in this passage. Now, I might just say um, a word. Some have asked, what translation on earth is that that they hand out 
Uh, that's just my own translation. It doesn't have any particular virtue, but I find in our congregation uh, that we have people who have English translations. There may be four or five, and, and it's not necessarily uniform. They don't necessarily have the same thing. So sometimes when I work through something, I provide a translation. So I don't have to say, well, now, this is different from the NIV here, and it's different from the uh, New King James there, and so on. You can, you can do that kind of work yourself. And uh, we just let give a, a kind of a base or working translation and fly with that. Let's hear the word of God. I heard and my insides tremble. At the voice my lips quivered. Rottenness enters into my bones and my legs tremble beneath me because I must wait quietly for the day of distress to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree does not blossom and though there's no fruit on the vines, though the produce of the olive tree has failed and the fields have not produced food, though he has cut off the flock from the fold and though there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I, I will exult in Yahweh. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. And he made my feet like those of a deer and he makes me tread upon my high places to the music master on my stringed instruments. I have to explain something just in case the, uh, an illusion wouldn't be picked up. And uh, so this is sort of the introduction to the introduction. Uh, back in about, I'm not sure of the dates because I don't have my books with me, about 16, maybe in the 1680 or so, there was a, a small crofter by the name of John Brown from around Priest Hill in Scotland. And uh, he, um, uh, was pressured by the government. He, he didn't go with the, uh, the established religion that, that was trying to be imposed on them. He would harbor sometimes, uh, uh, in that case, Presbyterian preachers, and he would lead Bible studies and so on. And finally, a fellow by the name of Claverhouse, who was a thug, uh, who went around making people miserable and so on, uh, caught up with him along with his dragoons uh, near his cottage, brought him to his cottage door and said, say, say goodbye to your wife and your bairns because you must die. He also allowed him a little time for prayer. And then, uh, according to one story, he ordered his men to, to drop John Brown, uh, shoot him, and they refused to do it. They were so moved by his prayer. Uh, and so Claverhouse himself blew John Brown's brains out, and then he turned to his widow and said, what do you think of your husband now? And Isabel Brown said, I have always thought ever so much of him, and I think even more of him now. Now come about... <clears throat> several hundred years later, to probably the 1920s, maybe the late 1920s, and Arthur John Gossip is preaching a sermon that has become rather famous, but when life tumbles in, what then? That was the title. Dr. Gossip preached the sermon shortly after the sudden death of his wife. He said to the people that day, I don't think that anyone will challenge my right to speak today. And what I have to say is this. When Claverhouse suddenly shot Brown of Priesthill, the callous brute turned to the wife and asked, what do you think of your husband now? And she, gathering together the scattered brains, answered, I always thought greatly of him but I think more of him now. I always thought greatly of the Christian faith, but I think more of it now, far more. What was Dr. Gossip doing there when he said that? He was going on living by faith. He was taking the faith he professed and walking in that faith in his circumstances. That's what the prophet is doing in our text tonight. He has had the revelation of God, 
and he has had the revelation of God's secret for how to maneuver through the coming hard times of the Babylonian invasion and ravaging of Judah. And now he is applying chapter 2, verse 4, the second part of the verse, to his own circumstances as he goes on trembling and trusting at the same time. Now, as I said, this section tonight, chapter 3 of Habakkuk, verses 16 to 19, is still part of Habakkuk's prayer, and we'll try to link it up with the previous part of that prayer that we saw, looked at last night, and we'll, we'll try to link it up a little bit later. But primarily, this is a kind of a confession of faith at the end of that prayer. And pondering his confession of faith will encourage us to go on living by faith. So let's look at it. Now in each case, I'm going to make an observation in the uh, usual pedantic way we do. Uh, one, two, three, etc. And each time there's a certain corollary or principle which I want to uh, underscore with that. First of all, notice the turmoil faith can know. Verse 16, the turmoil faith can know. I heard and my, my insides tremble. At the voice, my lips quivered. Rottenness enters into my bones and my legs tremble beneath me because I must wait quietly for the day of distress to come upon people who invade us. Now, here's the principle that goes with this. One can be in severe turmoil and yet still have vital faith. Indeed, that very turmoil may be evidence of faith. I'll run that through again. One can be in severe turmoil and yet still have vital faith. Indeed, that very turmoil may be evidence of faith. Now, what is it that Habakkuk hears? He said, I heard and my insides tremble. Well, it's the same thing as we saw in chapter 3, verse 2. When he says he, he heard the report of Yahweh's work, he, and so on, and he, and he feared it, and all of that. Well, what is the work? And it's the work that Yahweh mentioned in chapter 1, verse 5, that he was raising up the Chaldeans to come and bring judgment and, and ravage his, his own people, Judah. Uh, and that is the word, then, of the Babylonian invader. It's the prospect of a foreign invasion that is coming. And the horrors that holds for both prophet and people. It tears him up. He takes four lines to describe that. My insides tremble, my lips quivered, rottenness enters into my bones, and my legs tremble beneath me. He is indeed in great, great turmoil. And so there's the task he dreads. What can he do? Well, the last of verse 16... I do all of this because I must wait quietly for the day of distress to come upon people who invade us. There's nothing really I can do, but I can just wait for it to come, and not just for, for the invasion to come, but I can only wait until God brings judgment on the Babylonian invader as he said he would do in chapter 2. I must wait quietly for the day of distress to come upon people who invade us. I know there's another way of translating that, but I think the one we have here is preferable. Let's not go into that detail right now. Now, what I want you to see here is that Habakkuk's turmoil, and perhaps your turmoil as well, Habakkuk's turmoil is not a denial of faith, but it is the evidence of faith. He is all upset precisely because he believes God's word. He has faith in God's word, and he's trembling over it. It's the truth that gives him the trouble. Because you are upset and trembling does not mean you lack faith. Jesus said in John 12, 27, now is my soul trouble. What do you want to say to Jesus? You want to say, oh Lord, I think if you just had a little more faith, you wouldn't have that sort of attitude. No, I don't think we want to go there, do we? So it is here. 
Habakkuk heard Yahweh's word, and because he believed Yahweh's word about what was coming and what he would do, he is disturbed. Sometimes it's like that. We had our oldest son went to a preschool a number of years ago when we were living in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, he was probably, I suppose, around four years old. It was a preschool near our home, and he just went in the mornings, uh, I believe, and maybe not even every morning, but uh, some mornings he was down there at the preschool, and uh, they would get out, uh, I don't know when it was, sometime over the noon hour, um, fairly soon after noon, after noon, the noon hour itself. Um, and uh, I, I hope you don't think I'm bragging on my kid when I say this. I, I always get a little aggravated. I don't know what it's like here, but in the States, uh, you'll see uh, parents put bumper stickers on their vehicles. My child is an honor student at Thames Elementary School. <laughs> All that sort of thing. I, I don't think you folks are as arrogant, of course. Um, I, I, I almost wish I could go back in time and maybe put my child is an average student at Thames Elementary School. They never do that. Um, so by this, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that, that there were, in, in certain ways, Luke was advanced over other preschoolers. Not in every way, but in some ways. He was pretty quick to pick things up, and he could tell time. Now, a lot of other kids in his class couldn't tell time. Uh, so, um, uh, one day Barbara was a little bit late picking Luke up. I don't know, there was some delay or something. And uh, if that happened with other kids, I don't think it bothered them at all because they couldn't tell time. They didn't know what the clock on the wall meant. It didn't matter where the hands were. It was just out to lunch for them over that. But Luke could tell time. And he knew his mother was late. It was 1230. And he was all shook up and crying and so on and distraught over it. Now, it wasn't because some, uh, of some deficiency, you might say emotional deficiency, I don't know, but, but, but it wasn't because of some deficiency that, that Luke was all upset. It was precisely because he was sharper than a lot of others that he was upset. And, that, and that's the sort of principle here. Sometimes there's a proper reaction, and sometimes the proper reaction is trembling and fear. Sometimes the proper reaction to God's Word is to be distressed, and that distress is the sign of faith, that that faith holds God's Word as true. It's the right response. I was in, uh, I don't know if it was 44 or 45, after the allies were sort of overrunning Germany, that some of the uh, allied generals, so at least some of the American generals, George Patton and uh, Omar Bradley, and I think Eisenhower was there too, uh, took a visit, made a visit to the German uh, concentration camp at uh, Ordruf Nord. Uh, they saw some 3,200 naked, bony corpses that lay in shallow graves. Others that were covered with lice were sprawled in the streets. It made them both angry and sick and so on. There probably wasn't a more hard-bitten uh, general or soldier in the whole American army than George S. Patton. He became uncontrollably ill. Uh, he went off and vomited. You might say, now what kind of a response is that? Surely you ought to have some kind of a more controlled, at least a more sanitary response than that kind of thing. But the point is, no. That was the right kind of response for what he saw. That was the proper way to respond. And when Habakkuk here describes himself, you might say, falling apart and caving in because of the word of God he heard and what that would mean for him and for his countrymen. That was the right response. It showed that he really believed God's word. 
I simply want you to see that this turmoil and distress is the turmoil and distress of faith. We sometimes think that faith will relieve the pressure and the distress. No, it may well increase it. It may make it worse. If I believe Jesus' words in Luke 17, 22, then I will be more upset. I will be more aggravated, not less. When he said to his disciples, and it's in the context of suffering that's going to come for them, days are coming when you'll desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. Things may be so bad for you that you'll, you'll long and desire one of the days when the Son of Man reigns on earth and when His kingdom has come in its fullness and you won't see it. And if you believe what Jesus said, you might cringe. You may not like, you may be upset. It may cause you fear. And the fear can be an expression of, that, of your faith in that it shows you really do believe what, what Jesus says. It's necessary to state this because we tend to think that faith always leads to a peaceful, placid state of mind. But it may bring the distress and the turmoil. That's the distress and the turmoil of faith. That's the turmoil faith can know. Now, secondly, let's look at the destitution faith may face. Verse 17, the destitution faith may face. And this is probably perhaps the best known part of Habakkuk in this day. Though the fig tree does not blossom and though there's no fruit on the vines, though the produce of the olive tree has failed and the fields have not produced food, though he has cut off the flock from the fold and though there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I, I will exult in Yahweh and so on. Now here's the principle that goes along with that. Faith does not guarantee my level of comfort. Faith may have to exist in utterly destitute circumstances. Now, I don't like that, but it seems to me that's what the text is saying. Faith does not guarantee my level of comfort. Faith may have to exist in utterly destitute circumstances. Now, let's look at the picture in the text in verse 17. And as you look at that, <coughs> you may think, well... I don't have any cattle, etc. I'm not raising any crops. Uh, no skin off my nose. But you know this is down at the basic level and you know that this is an agrarian economy and you notice, know that this touches every, every part of, of Judah's life. The picture you have in verse 17 is of a devastated land and economy. You have a worst case scenario what sort of life will it be without figs and without grapes and wine, without olives and olive oil, without uh, food from the field and grain crops, without milk and so on, uh, without, uh, when, when every luxury and necessity is taken away. It's evidence, of course, of God's judgment here in verse 17 by means of or through what we call the covenant curses. Uh, sometime, you don't need to do it now, but sometime you might want to look at Deuteronomy 28. In that uh, chapter, Deuteronomy 28, you have a, a, a short section at the first that has the blessings of the covenant. That's what God promises if Israel is faithful to keep basically first commandment obedience. And, and, and so on, and worship only Yahweh, and, and have no truck with other gods, then there are certain blessings. But then, a much longer section, if they, if they abandon Yahweh and so on, or are unfaithful to Him, there's a whole series of what are called covenant curses, and those are uh, laid out in great detail. Some of them uh, are, the, are, you can see here in verse 17, these kinds of things will be taken away as a part of God's judgment on his people. Now, just because you have a famine or something in your land doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a, 
a direct judgment from God. But this was set up in Israel. There were these covenant curses, and he would bring them about if, if his people were faithless toward him. What you also see in verse 17 is at the same time, uh, the sort of uh, thing that would happen when a land was ravaged by an invading army that might be following a scorched earth policy. And the problem is, you see, as you look at verse 17, is that the remnant, when I use that, I mean the, the believing minority in the, among the people of Judah, Habakkuk and those who shared his faith in Yahweh and still clung to Yahweh and, and followed his word, that that believing remnant in Judah would also suffer under this coming devastation of the Babylonians. What the whole nation went through, they too would have to endure. There was no blue and yellow exemption card that came through social services or something like that that had your name on it and said, member of the remnant exempt. No, no. You went through it with the rest of the nation. And uh, you were not spared the havoc and the horrors of the invasion. Now, if Habakkuk was writing this to a more uh, contemporary nation, there might be other manifestations. He might say something like, all industry grinds to a halt. The stock market crashes. Banks start closing. The underground train is always on strike. Utilities no longer function. Terrorists leave neighborhoods in flames. Grocery shelves are bare and agriculture is in ruins. God in his mercy may repeatedly cushion us from this, but sometimes he may call faith to suffer. It may be corporately, as the, a, a whole body of the church, or it may be individually, but he may call faith to suffer, as Paul puts it in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, the loss of all things. That's basically what you have in verse 17 that's depicted there. If he does, if you are stripped, if part of, a part of God's people, or if you personally, if you are stripped of all human resources, that does not mean that you lack faith. You know, why do we need to make such a point? Well, you need to make such a point, I think, because there's much contemporary confusion about faith and prosperity teaching that floats around, at least in our own country. But I'm concerned about more than that. I think there's a lot of flimsy piety as well. It comes and creeps into even some of our hymns sometimes. And we shouldn't sing bad theology. You know, there's a fairly well-known and sometimes well-loved gospel hymn, and if you like it, I'm not against it, not against all of it. Um, but trust and obey. No other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But I have real problems with the second stanza in that. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies. But his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. And I tend to think that Habakkuk would say, really? Do you really believe that? Or is that going over the line? I thought it was ironic on uh, November 7th, as I look back on it, I didn't think of it so much maybe until after it occurred, but on November 7th, 1993, we were in Baltimore, and that was a Sunday. I was preaching on that date from Habakkuk 3, 16 to 19. What was ironic was that the day before was the funeral of one of our elders, a man 55 years old with a wife and three sons. 
He had complications with his pancreas. One thing led to another. He ended up in Johns Hopkins Hospital. He was on life support. He was on tubes and, and, and uh, wires and, and monitors and all of that. And it uh, got so difficult that the doctor seemed to indicate to his wife that he was really brain dead. And if he did survive at all, he would be nothing but a vegetable. And they were putting some pressure upon her to have them pull the plug. So it was a very difficult time. Their whole world was falling in. And uh, God, in his mercy, I think, um, didn't allow her not to have to make that kind of decision. Uh, Dan began to, to uh, deteriorate. And... Uh, I remember the day when we were standing around that cubicle with all the monitors and everything else and drips and everything going on, and they were trying to communicate with, with their husband and father who showed no responsiveness whatever. And we watched the monitor go down from 20 and so on, on down to zero, and they immediately unhooked them from everything. And in that moment, a woman became a widow, and sons became fatherless. It was miles and centuries away from Habakkuk 3.17, but it was their own form of destitution that faith faced there. And I thought it was ironic that the next day I had to preach from that text. It can be that way for believers, and it's not a sign of the weakness of your faith, and it's not an indication that you don't have faith. You can be utterly destitute Faith may sometimes have to exist in utterly destitute conditions. And that is not a minus mark on your faith. It's too bad that even needs to be said. Jesus, I think, understood that. If I could paraphrase Satan in Luke 4, verses 2 to 4. Jesus is in the wilderness and he's being tempted by the devil. He's told to turn uh, stones into bread. What is the appeal there? Well, something, something like this. Satan says, you have nothing. Your father has left you destitute. But you have power to act independently. You see those stones? You can command the bread to come to you. You need not submit to this set of circumstances. As a son of God, you have the power to act on your own and bail yourself out of this. What kind of father is he who would leave the son he loves in whom he is delighted? Remember your baptism, Jesus. In such horrendous straits. Was Jesus lacking faith? Was his father displeased with him? I didn't think so. So it doesn't mean you have no faith. It doesn't even necessarily mean your faith is weak, though it probably usually is. It only means that sometimes you'll share Jesus' position. And so you need to hear it here because you won't hear it on religious broadcasting hardly at all. You can be stripped of all things except of a father who's still delighted in you even when you're destitute. That's the destitution. Faith may face. Now thirdly, let's pick up on verse 18. And let us notice the joy that faith can confess in verses 18 through half of 19. 
Yet I, I will exult in Yahweh. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength, and he made my feet like those of a deer, and he makes me tread upon my high places. Now, in the middle, <clears throat> well, let me put it this way. Here's the, here's the principle here. In the middle of desperate circumstances, faith can not only persist and endure, but can actually rejoice. I'm not saying that because I'm good at it. I'm saying it because it's in the text. In the middle of desperate circumstances, faith can not only persist and endure, but actually rejoice. Now notice there's a certain defiance about this, this joy in, in verse 18. It has to be seen, right? We'll come back to this in light of verse 17. Then he says, yet I, I, it's an emphatic I, I will exalt in Yahweh. This isn't any mere resignation. This isn't just some sort of stoicism. This isn't a grit and bear it attitude. This isn't uh, some sort of this too shall pass statement. This is a note of triumphant, positive joy. I will exult in Yahweh. Now there's more than just the defiance of this joy here in the face of, of his projected conditions, but there's also the location of the joy. You notice that? He exalts in Yahweh. He rejoices in the God of my salvation. What does that mean? It means that he rejoices in the one whom the Babylonians cannot take away from him. He may not have flocks in the folds. He may not have an olive crop. He may not have fruit on the vines, but he cannot be deprived of Yahweh, the God of his salvation. There is something, there is someone that the Babylonians cannot plunder. That's the location of his joy. And you notice the secret of it in verse 19. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. This joy and confidence are not from ourselves, but come from divine enabling. Yahweh, my God, is my strength. I think the way that is meant there is that this joy and confidence is possible because Yahweh, as our strength, enables us to have it. It's the same sort of thing, I think, that you have in the famous passage in Philippians 4, where Paul says, I've learned the secret, you know, sometimes of having an abundance or sometimes being in great want. I'm content whatever situation or circumstance I've, I'm in. And then in, in Philippians 4, 13, he says, I am strong enough for all things, I think he means all circumstances, in the one who keeps on giving me strength. That's the secret. So here, Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes this buoyancy possible. And he's the one that gives me the steadiness and the steadfastness I need in the next two lines of verse 19 when he talks about the feet of the deer. I don't think he's talking about speed necessarily. I think he's talking about steadiness and steadfastness. And so God gives that as well. I think there are many of the Lord's people who can testify to such joy even in the midst of their distress and testify to the Lord's life-giving strength in their deepest troubles. You know that. Many of you could. I think it was E.B. Pusey who... Uh, made the statement after his wife's death. He said, it was as if the rushing waters were up to my chin, but underneath the chin, there's a hand supporting it. There's some of you, I think, can know what that is like. So, you can only, though, appreciate this joy as it's expressed in verse 18 and 19 if you see it in the context of verse 17, as if it's this joy that defies circumstances, that's still there and somehow can't be taken away in spite of them. 
And it's not necessarily prophets or great servants of the Lord, as we sometimes think about it, who have this. I don't know if you ever read J.I. Packer's Rediscovering Holiness, but near the end of Packer's book, Rediscovering Holiness, he tells of a woman by the name of Mabel, who was someone uh, that a fellow named Tom Schmidt interviewed. Uh, Packer says that Mabel was a blind, deaf, disease-ridden, and cancerous old lady of 89. And Tom Schmidt met her in a convalescent home where she had been bedridden for 25 years. He asked her what she thought about as she passed her lonely days and nights, and she said, I think about Jesus. Schmidt asked, what do you think about Jesus? Now, I know that Packer said she was deaf, so I assume Schmidt hollered at her and she could hear. Just for those of you who overanalyze things, you can find <laughs> So he asked, what, what do you think about Jesus? And she replied slowly and deliberately as Tom Schmidt wrote. And this is what she said. I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those kind who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks wouldn't care much for what I think. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned, but I don't care I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. Now, please understand, I don't bring that up because Mabel's way ahead of me, and I don't bring that up to make you feel like, ooh, I need to be a Mabel. He may not always be a Mabel. I bring that up to say that it's possible to be a blind, deaf, disease ridden cancerous old lady who's been bedridden for 25 years and yet still think that Jesus is all the world to you. Seems to me that's a bit of joy in the midst of a whole lot of junk. And I don't bring that up to make us feel bad about ourselves, as some people sometimes are concerned, but simply to say it's not that she's some outstanding Christian who makes all the glossy evangelical prints and so on and, and is a sort of a Christian all-star. No. Mabel, just common stuff. And Jesus was all the world to her. It's the joy faith can confess. Now, fourthly, I want to push you on if you're will let me, to the tradition faith should receive. The tradition faith should receive. The last line of verse 19, and we'll pick up on some other matters. To the music master on my stringed instruments. Now, let me mention the principle or the corollary that goes along with this. It is this, faith should be ready to use prepared and written prayers. Faith should, be, faith should be prepared to use written and prepared prayers. You're going to say, Davis, I knew you were high church. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. But notice that last line in 19, to the music master on my stringed instruments. You're saying, what's going on there? Well, you have to bring in, either from last night's translation or your own Bible, you have to bring in the rest of chapter 3, don't you? You remember how it started out, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, and then it had something like, on Shigianoth. What's that? Well, it might be the tune for the prayer and the psalm that's in chapter 3. We don't really know. You can get all kinds of good scholarly guesses if you check the commentaries and that sort of thing, but it might be the name of the tune, much like you might have in some of our hymnals. You have the hymn tune. It might be Hamburg. It might be Quebec. It may be Regent Square and so on, or it could be Shigianoth. I don't know what, maybe Richard and Andy have that written out somewhere as a tune. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but it could be the name of the tune. Now, why is that there? Why do you have the, who knows what it really means, Selah or Sela, 
uh, in uh, verses 3 and 9 and 13? Well, because it's a psalm, and it has these notations, musical or otherwise, in them. And, 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 and then, in verse 19, to the music master on my stringed instruments. What's going on here? This tells you that the psalm and the prayer was to be used in public worship. It would be used again and repeatedly, apparently, in the public worship of God's people. What does that assume? It assumes two things. It assumes that this prayer, in chapter 3, ought to be used in worship, and that there will be probably a need for it to be used in worship. What's the thinking here? Well, it's as if Habakkuk and the believers associated with him, by putting this and noting it so that it could be used in public worship and so on, it's as if the believers who are, well, let me put it in their mouths. It's as, it's as if Habakkuk and those associated with him are saying, we believers who are living in, say, 607 B.C., awaiting the devastation that Babylon will wreak on us, are not the only body of the Lord's people who are going to be overwhelmed and feel like we're swept away. In other succeeding days, there will be more of the Lord's people who will be facing similar situations. So let's leave behind something for them. Let's leave something that says, now when you're in those kinds of times, here's how you can pray. Let's leave a prayer for them. And so they're saying to us, I think, here's how you pray. Now you have to go back and take in the whole sweep of chapter 3. I won't do that in any detail, but simply to say, if they were to say, here's how you pray in such situations. First, you make no secret of your fears, verses 1 and 2. Then you fill your vision with the God who comes to save, verses 3 through 15. And then you look again at your circumstances and delight in the joy that no one can take from you, verses 16 to 19. And it's as if Habakkuk and his people are saying, we've written that down for you so you can use it. Aren't Habakkuk and company kind? They say, you know, there are going to be other generations living in the midst of the years. And they will ask, how should we pray in such times? And the answer is, take the prayers of others who have already walked this way and pray them again. Haven't you found that you can do that? the Psalms and prayers of the Bible, there was someone who did with this very prayer in his own way. He was a man who was never healed of his problem. He became a Christian, but he never received healing. He suffered six serious depressive breakdowns suffered through several suicide attempts, and endured much mental pain. Oftentimes he was very depressed, or as they called it in that time, melancholy. Not, not constantly. He had fine periods sometimes when he was, seemed quite well, but there were dark, dark days sometimes. And you probably have heard of William Cooper looks like Cowper, but Cooper probably, or however you pronounce it, he has a hymn called, Sometimes a Light Surprises the Christian While He Sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again a season of clear shining to cheer it after rain. And then the second stanza. Though vine nor fig tree neither their wonted fruit shall bear, though all the fields should wither, nor flocks nor herds be there, yet God the same abideth, his praise shall tune my voice, for while in him confiding, I cannot but rejoice. 
What's Cooper doing? He's taking Habakkuk's prayer and praying it again. He's doing what they wanted him to do. And that's something for us. So if you're weighed down with trouble and you don't know, a la Romans 8.26, what to pray for as you ought, then use our words, Habakkuk says. Pray our prayers. God will recognize them. He's heard them before. Let us pray. Thank you, our God, for prophecy that begins with distress and ends with stringed instruments. For it is a sort of a sign to us that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Lift us up, we pray, O Lord, and set our feet upon a rock. Grant that we would not seek to become notable Christians and that we would not seek to be a part of outstanding churches, but grant that we would seek to go on living by our faith. In Jesus' name and for our sake. Amen.